Well, hello. Um, welcome to this um, symposium, uh, the Accelerating Medicines Partnership in Schizophrenia, uh, New Opportunities for Early Intervention. Um, so AMP Schizophrenia, um, as we call it for short, um, is a, as a new consortium uh, examining uh, outcomes and predictors in the ultra high risk or the um, clinical high risk for psychosis uh, clinical population. Um, and we'll hear all about uh, the purpose, uh, structure and progress of the consortium to date um, in this symposium today. So we have um, four speakers, all with uh, pre-recorded uh, presentations and time for some live uh, Q&A at the end. Um, and I've just got a few sort of housekeeping um, points to make before we start the first talk. Uh, just a reminder, as with the other uh, presentations, to use the chat function uh, next to the live stream uh, to make any comments. Um, and interact with other, um, with other audience members, other attendees. Um, and if you're using uh, social media platforms, don't forget to use the conference hashtag um, IEPA2021 virtual. Uh, and if you want to ask a question to a speaker, uh, please use the ask the question uh, button under the live stream, the sort of green uh, colored button there. And if you send your questions uh, through at any time, questions or comments, um, I'll keep note of them, and then we can um, uh, raise them at the end of the uh, end of the symposium in the live um, Q and A period. Okay, so we'll um, launch into it. So I'd just like to introduce our first uh, presenter, uh, Dr. Sarah Morris. Um, Sarah Morris, um, PhD, is the Chief of the Adult Psychopathology and Psychosocial Interventions Research Branch of the NIMH Division of Translational Research and Associate Head of the Research Domain Criteria Unit. Uh, Dr. Morris, and a, a BA from Scripps College and a PhD in Clinical Psychology from the University of California, Los Angeles. So, Sarah, over to you. Hello, and thank you to the conference organizers and thank you to Barnaby Nelson for organizing this symposium. Um, it probably goes without saying to this group that um, schizophrenia is an illness that typically evolves over time through the stages shown here. Most of the time treatment is delivered after a clinical deterioration and in the chronic phase of illness. We're badly in need of new treatments for schizophrenia, but we have increasing understanding all the time of various candidate mechanisms involving genetics, synaptic development, long-range connectivity, and glutamate functioning, all of which suggest pathways from biology to psychosis that could be treatment targets. Some, if not all of these mechanisms may be specific to a particular phase of illness, and may have cascading effects over illness trajectories. So to test this, it's necessary to stratify patients at the appropriate phase, and intervening in the prodromal phase is an especially appealing possibility to delay or prevent onset of the psychosis syndrome to alter the course of illness and improve outcomes. We have methods already to identify people who are at elevated risk for psychosis among help-seeking individuals, and algorithms such as that developed by the Naples group to quantify psychosis risk. But there's a lot of heterogeneity in outcomes and likely in illness-related mechanisms among at-risk individuals. So what is needed is a study of the program that is large enough to stratify patients according to trajectories to try to identify biomarkers of diverse risk trajectories via deep phenotyping. So in summary, we need reliable methods to predict variability in disease course to enable treatment trials for new medications. The Accelerating Medicines Partnership in Schizophrenia is a collaborative research project consisting of two harmonized research networks. First, one that goes by the name PRONET, led by Scott Woods, Carrie Bearden, and John Kane, and one called Prescient led by Barnaby Nelson and Pat McGorry. And the PREDICT Data Processing Analysis and 
Coordination Center, or DPAC. The project will enroll 1,900 individuals with clinical, risk, clinical high risk for psychosis and 640 healthy controls at 42 sites in North America, Australia, Europe, and Asia, and follow them for two years using a study battery that I'll describe shortly. Here are the full titles and details of the AMP Schizophrenia Grants. And the government agencies, industry partners, private foundation, and nonprofit partners are listed here. The total budget for the project is 99 million US dollars, with over $16 million coming contributed by partner organizations via the Foundation for NIH and over 82 million from the NIMH. By way of background about the Accelerating Medicines Partnership, it's a flagship public-private partnership organized by the Foundation for NIH to improve the productivity of therapeutics development in major diseases. There are currently projects focused on six disease areas listed here with involvement from 18 industry partners, 17 nonprofit organizations, and th three different government entities. The pathway to the AMP Schizophrenia Project spans many years, with its origins under former NIMH Director Tom Insel, and a renewed effort in 2019 under our current director, Josh Gordon, with NIMH funding opportunities issued in late 2019, and then the project launching in September of last year. In summary, AMP Schizophrenia is a public-private partnership managed by the Foundation for NIH to address the need for therapeutic intervention for people at risk for schizophrenia. With a shared mission of discovering biomarkers to identify risk, track progression, and identify targets for treatment. The US Food and Drug Administration will provide regulatory guidance and all data and analyses will be made publicly available through the NIMH data archive. AMP Schizophrenia can be thought of as three related projects. First, the Data Processing Analysis and Coordination Center, which will work closely with the networks and the NIMH data archive. Then the Harmonized and the Harmonized Research Networks themselves. And a third future phase, that will consist of proof of principle clinical trials, which will be developed following the evaluation of to be determined go no go criteria. AMP Schizophrenia will collect multimodal deep phenotyping data and a broad range of clinical endpoints to develop risk stratification algorithms focused on three broad outcome categories those who develop psychosis, those who have persistent impairment but don't develop psychosis, and those for whom CHR symptoms remit. This is an overview of the study protocol that includes self-report measures, cognitive tasks, MRI, EEG, fluid-based markers, device-based monitoring, and speech sampling, all of which will be described in detail in the following presentations. Thank you very much for your attention. Okay. Thanks very much, Sarah. I, I think I think the presentation's still ongoing, Jason. Ah, I still have Sarah presenting on, on my screen here. Oh, okay, I'm with you. <laughs> okay, thanks very much. Okay, well, thanks very much for your presentation, um, Dr. Sarah Morris. Um, now, I can't, don't think any uh, questions have appeared yet, so I'll keep an eye on, on that. 
Um, and if you do have any questions for, uh, for Sarah, please just pop them there and uh, we can come back to them uh, later on in the, in the Q&A. Okay, um, so our next presenter is um, Professor Scott Woods. Um, so Scott Woods MD is Professor of Psychiatry at uh, Yale School of Medicine and Director of the Psychiatry Department's Prime Research Clinic for the Psychosis Clinical High-Risk Syndrome at the Connecticut Mental Health Center. Uh, so please welcome Scott and um, over, to, over to Scott's presentation. Hello, I'm Scott Woods, one of the principal investigators for PRONET, the Psychosis Risk Outcomes Network, which itself is one of three grants funded by the U.S. National Institutes of Mental Health as part of the Accelerating Medicines Partnership, Schizophrenia, or AMP, SCZ. I apologize for not being a very good recording engineer. The clinical high risk field has developed a number of opportunities um, over the last uh, 25 years. Um, uh, and these include um, that CHR is increasingly recognized as a, as a valid diagnosis associated with serious adverse health outcomes, and that specialized clinics for CHR are increasingly supported worldwide. However, there are no registered medication treatments, safe and specific, for CHR. And the reason, or one of the reasons that we have no safe and specific medications for CHR is that the, our field has not adequately addressed several key questions needed to design these uh, clinical trials that could lead to registration and then the subsequent public health benefit. Those questions that need to be addressed are, what are the key outcomes that could potentially lead to treatment indications? What measures should be used to record these outcomes? What is the optimal trial duration for each of these outcomes? And how should, how, most importantly, how should patients be selected from the general CHR uh, population or group um, if a trial is focusing on a particular um, outcome? The aims of PRONET are to ad address these questions in, in partnership with Prescient, our sister. Um, um, data collection network also funded by NIH and AMP, um, the um, Data Processing and Coordinating Center, and um, NIMH and FNIH. The um, various potential outcomes that are actionable for CHR include positive and negative symptoms, affective symptoms, anxiety symptoms, functioning, cognition, remission, as well as conversion. And one of the um, key uh, complications that um, PRONET and um, the other uh, awardees, uh, NIH awardees will be addressing is that for each of these outcomes, the individual patient trajectories shown here are variable, both before we ascertain them, shown here, ascertainment, and after we ascertain them. So one of the key um, uh, goals of the AMP Schizophrenia Consortium is to map some of this early, uh, these early trajectory uh, variable, uh, variability in order to predict future um, uh, trajectories for each of these outcomes, and then to select a group of subjects who are more likely to follow one of these trajectories um, that would be um, 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 advantageous for the future clinical trials. To, 
to address these goals, we needed a large number of subjects. And so um, I'm very proud to show that um, PRONET um, uh, consists of 26 sites in eight different countries on three different continents, including two sites in Canada, two in the UK, three in the EU, and two in Asia. These are the um, site PIs for each site without whom um, nothing could be accomplished in um, uh, PRONET. Um, and uh, so they deserve a shout out. Carrie Bearden at UCLA, Fred Sub and Carla Gerber in Oregon, Bill Stone at, um, BI, at Beth Israel at Harvard, John Kane and Barbara Kornblatt at Northwell, Deanna Perkins at UNC, Kristen Cadenhead at, in San Diego, Gene Addington in Calgary, Al Powers and myself at Yale, Daniel Mathalon in San Francisco, Monica Calkins and Daniel Wolf at, at Penn, Cheryl Corcoran at Mount Sinai, Leslie Horton at Pittsburgh, BJ Middle at Northwestern, Jason Schiffman at, at UC Irvine, Lauren Elman at Temple, Greg Strauss at University of Georgia, Dan Yomama at Washington University, Jimmy Choi and Godfrey Perlson at Hartford Hospital, Jay Shaw in Montreal, Paolo Fuser Pali will have two sites, King's College London and the University of Pavia in Italy. Felso Arango and Cova Martinez in Madrid, Jesus Perez in Cambridge, Nikos Kutzeleras in Munich, Jijun Wang in Shanghai, and Junsu Kwan in Seoul at Seoul National University. Um, Pronet, the PRONET leadership structure, I'm very proud that John Kane from Northwell and Carrie Bearden from UCLA have joined me as multiple PIs for PRONET. And we have 11 core directors as well. Gene Addington for um, ascertainment and outcomes, Bill Stone for cognition, Paolo Fuzipali for environmental risk factors, Philip Wolf from Emory for natural language processing, John Torres from uh, Beth Israel for uh, digital assessments, M Machiri Keshevan also from Beth Israel for uh, pilot projects, Alan Antichevich for uh, data transfer from Yale, Daniel Matalon from um, UCSF for EEG, Deanna Perkins from University of North Carolina for fluids and um, genetics. John Cahill, also from Yale for uh, website development. And uh, Tyrone Cannon, also from Yale for uh, data analysis. The two networks are fully harmonized and together we'll recruit almost 2000 CHR subjects, including a little over a thousand from uh, from PRONET. Um, the subjects will be followed for two years using identical measurement protocols with outcomes and biomarkers carefully justified. And in addition, we have an important matched healthy subject group. This slide shows a summary of what is a very detailed schedule of assessment. Um, um, the subjects will be ascertained at screen. Um, Outcome measures will be determined at baseline and at these time points uh, over the over 24 months. There would be a, a separate conversion time point for those who convert to psychosis. And if subjects do convert to psychosis, they will, after conversion, continue to follow the same measurement protocol so that we will have full data on each, regardless of whether they convert or not. Um, outcome covariates like medication and substance abuse will be determined at each time point along with the outcome measures themselves. And um, we have biomarkers at baseline and at two months. And I'll be spending most of the rest of the talk talking about the biomarkers. We selected them based on their availability in clinical trial centers, their utility, 
for dissecting the heterogeneity of CHR, reliability and validity, as well as participant burden, training required, and appropriateness for diverse populations. These uh, selection factors resulted in a panel of harmonized biomarkers, MRI for T1 and T2 structural acquisitions, DTI and resting state fMRI, EEG, including P300, mismatch negativity, and resting state, polygenic risk score for genetics, salivary cortisol, um, as well as a, a panel of uh, additional analytes in the blood and saliva, which we um, uh, have yet to uh, determine. Cognition, natural language processing, ecological momentary assessment with both active and passive measures, and each of these, as I said, will be uh, um, assessed twice over two months for both static and dynamic prediction. Then the AMP schizophrenia protocol permits a number of uh, innovations for our field. Uh, first and foremost, we expect to have sufficient power with the nearly 2000 subjects um, that we can um, conduct independent replication and cross-validation. Uh, so that the uh, results hopefully should be uh, useful, immediately useful for the field once they are available. In addition, we have innovations in these three areas, which I will be highlighting one at a time. Um, dynamic uh, subject stratification, healthy the use of healthy subjects to enhance signal detection in the CHR group by reducing CHR variants due to site and age and reliability of measurement innovations. Starting with the dynamic stratification subject selection, these are preliminary data, um, structural MRI data from the third sample of the Naples Consortium on frontal cortical thickness um, over time in three groups subjects who will uh, convert to psychosis in the future and to control groups. And I should say that the uh, Naples 3 sample was unique in that it collected um, MRI data five times over the first eight months of the study, um, baseline and at two, four, six, and eight months, um, allowing us to um, uh, calculate these trajectories uh, in cortical thickness. And the results show that the group which is destined, which does convert to psychosis, but has not yet, uh, shows prior to conversion, a steeper decline in cortical thickness um, than in either of the two control groups, independent from medication effects. And that this steeper decline, this uh, trajectory of decline is uh, detectable with statistical significance, um, even at the two month time point. This kind of data, not just for MRI, but for um, uh, um, all of our other predictors as well, uh, potentially allows for uh, future clinical trials to uh, select subjects using a combined static and dynamic uh, subject selection algorithm. The usual um, as you all know, the usual uh, method is a static subject selection where patients are screened one time and then they're either randomized or excluded. Um, this design allows for subjects to be screened and then to have three options. So let's say we have a, a study for um, attenuated positive symptoms, that's the primary outcome, and their attenuated, attenuated positive symptoms are not quite high enough for them to meet the initial randomization criteria. That subject can be deferred and screened again at two months. Let's look at their trajectory. Um, they're, they're not quite severe enough at baseline, but what, what, what do we predict about their trajectory? Oh, those symptoms are going away. Um, their MRI is not uh, showing a decline. Uh, we'll exclude them. Oh their subjects are not going, their symptoms are continuing. 
and their, or their MRI is showing a, a decline in cortical thickness, let's go ahead and randomize them um, rather than excluding them as they would have had to been at, uh, in the beginning. In terms of the innovations due to healthy subjects, including healthy subjects in clinical trials, usually we don't include healthy subjects in clinical trials. Several of our investigators um, uh, um, are interested in potential uses of uh, subjects, um, healthy subjects in clinical trials, for example, to accommodate the expected differences in mean age across samples. Um, uh, 17 is common in US samples, whether European samples often have a mean CHR age in the mid 20s. Um, and also to look at the possibility of different developmental trajectories um, uh, as a function of the age that we happen to ascertain them at. We have innovations due to uh, improvements in the measurement protocol. Um, this high impedance electrode, um, high impedance electrodes in CAP uh, reduces the subject preparation time for EEG, should reduce subject fatigue, which is one of the sources of subject variance in um, uh, clinical studies. And we have importantly uniform acquisition across all of 40 plus sites in both networks using exactly the same um, um, EEG equipment. Uh, another source of variance in, um, uh, in, in biomarker studies in, includes the biospecimens. Several of the analytes that we're interested in unfortunately undergo continued metabolism um, in the tube after the subject, after the uh, um, or can um, after the blood is uh, drawn from the subject. And um, well, we have a very careful measurement protocol to um, minimize these effects and have them be identical across site. Uh, and we are very uh, proud that we have uh, harmonized uh, uh, cognition uh, collection across samples. Um, the two networks were originally um, originally created protocols independently. And it turned out that of all these tests that were proposed in PRONET and in present here, only one of them was actually shared in common. And um, uh, through a lot of hard work for the uh, uh, cognition investigators, we were able to come up with a uniform uh, cognition um, procedure across uh, uh, sites and networks. These um, innovations and these uh, uh, lead to the following deliverables for uh, PRONET and AMP schizophrenia, a panel of outcomes that could potentially lead to treatment indications uh, for patients for, for these novel, medic, novel, safe, and specific medications that we need for CHR. For example, uh, a potential drug could be labeled this way new drug X is indicated for the treatment of cognitive impairment in patients at clinical high risk for psychosis. Um, other deliverables of the um, AMP partnership and PRONET uh, as well include recommended measures to record these outcomes, strong estimates of their expected values and variability over time, in the future clinical trial placebo groups, which will allow future clinical trial designers to be able to uh, determine a sample size for each of these different outcomes. Recommendations for trial duration and measurement schedule, and these combined static and um, static dynamic subject selection tools that I've already spoken about. Lastly, we also will be making av publicly available a landmark data set with a nearly 2,000 CHR and healthy volunteers that will provide a solid guide to the next generation of research and public health advances in CHR. Thank you very much.
Well, thank you very much, Scott, for a great presentation outlining the PRONET network and uh, various outcomes that will come out of AMP schizophrenia. So um, I haven't seen any questions yet, but um, pop them into the on via the website if you do have any comments or questions, and we'll get back to them um, towards the end of the symposium. If you'd like to ask something of Scott or of the other presenters, that's fine. Um, okay, so I'm actually the uh, next presenter, uh, Barnaby Nelson. I'm uh, head of the Ultra High Risk uh, Research Program at Origin in Melbourne, um, and I'll be talking in this uh, pre-recorded presentation about uh, Prescient, uh, one of the research networks involved in AMP schizophrenia. Okay, hello everybody. Um, so I'll be talking about one of the research networks, Prescient, the uh, Prediction Scientific Global Consortium, uh, part of AMP Schizophrenia. Um, okay. So I'll do this talk in um, two sections. Firstly, um, we'll speak about the research network structure and the progress to date, um, and then move on to speaking about some more um, scientific aspects of AMP schizophrenia more broadly. So Australia um, is in this um, quite fortunate position of having a uh, federally uh, funded national network of uh, youth mental health services. Uh, called the Headspace uh, Network. Um, and these red boxes on the slide here indicate the um, Headspace clinics who are involved in the Prescient uh, Research Network, so recruiting UHR young people um, into this study. Um, and um, the yellow highlighted uh, Headspace clinics on the slide indicate the specialist early psychosis clinics. And some of those overlap with the, with the red boxes here and those are the clinics will be involved with uh, recruitment um, into, the, um, into the present network as well. So it'll be a combination of um, recruitment from primary uh, youth mental health services and more uh, specialist early psychosis services with origin um, in Melbourne, which you can see in the uh, background behind me. Um, being the hub, the central hub of this whole network with um, other recruitment clinics across Adelaide and Perth. Of course, there's an international uh, dimension to the whole uh, research network present as well. There are three Asian sites, Singapore, um, Hong Kong, South Korea, um, and um, five European-based sites. Um, and also uh, a number of scientific partners, uh, Royal College of Surgeons in Ireland, uh, University of Groningen and um, University of Queensland involved in the sort of scientific aspects of the project, but uh, won't be recruiting uh, participants themselves. Okay, in terms of um, sample size projections, uh, we're looking to recruit 937 CHR young people across this network of clinics over a two year period, you can see the breakdown of our recruitment targets on the table up here. So most of the um, recruitment is going to occur in uh, Melbourne and across the, um, the Australian recruitment sites, but also um, um, well represented in the other um, international sites as well. Also recruiting a healthy control group, a matched healthy control group um, to look at uh, normative data on the various measures and also to control for uh, possible side effects. Um, now there'll be a larger sample of healthy controls recruited in Melbourne in order to more effectively match um, our, uh, the clinical sample we aim to recruit in Melbourne. Okay, in terms of work to date, um, there's obviously been a lot of um, setup and, and background work underway to get the project to the point it's at at the moment. Um, you can see some of the activities we've been up to um, on the table up here, instrument translation, um, testing, you know, MRI sequences, staff training, obviously IRB submissions, um, working on uh, protocol harmonization with uh, PRONET, the other research networks, uh, to make sure we're collecting exactly the same type of data at the same time points, using the same measures and equipment, et cetera, so that data will uh, um, be able to be pooled further down the track for the purposes of analysis. 
Um, so we're at a point now where we can almost almost start recruiting um, to the study, and hopefully at the next IEPA we'll have some um, some data, some preliminary data to present. Okay, so moving on to some more uh, scientific aspects um, of AMP schizophrenia. So this is a um, little graphics that are summarizing the um, assessment protocol. A whole range of different modalities being assessed here. Um, so clinical uh, measures, neurocognitive tasks, MRI, EEG, speech and video recordings, blood and saliva collection, uh, and digital assessments. Um, now these are conducted regularly over a two year period with a repeat uh, biomarker collection time point at uh, month two follow up. Um, and the rationale for that follow up is really um, based on some preliminary analysis of existing data indicating that change over that period of time uh, may be most useful for predictive purposes and possibly then for the um, um, selection of an enriched sample for enrollment in, in clinical trials further down the track. Um, okay. Now, Scott Woods has probably uh, spoken already about a number of uh, the other assessment domain. So I'll focus on the clinical aspects, the speech and video recordings and digital assessments. So to start off with, uh, with the CHR ascertainment criteria, pretty standard criteria, 12 to 30 years, help accepting, uh, meeting either the SIPS or the CALM CHR criteria. A new instrument has been developed called the SYCHS, led by Scott Woods and Alison Young, um, that integrates these two measures. So both sets of criteria have been um, harmonized and will be um, able to be fully assessed using this Sykes measure across both networks. And also the uh, point at which conversion or transition um, is operationalized um, using both um, measures has been integrated or harmonized using the Sykes tool. Um, in terms of exclusion criteria, we've set a certain threshold for um, previous exposure to antipsychotic medication. Um, if a person is referred on antipsychotic medication and it's still below that threshold, they could be titrated off the medication and be enrolled in the study at that point. Um, other exclusion criteria, history of intellectual disability, traumatic brain injury, um, central nervous system disorder, um, and obviously a current or a past um, psychotic episode, whether treated or untreated. Now, in terms of the healthy controls, uh, we were pretty keen not to recruit the sort of super healthy control group and, you know, full victim to that, um, that mistake. So we're excluding people based on meeting um, UHR criteria, a current or past cluster A personality disorder or current treatment of psychotropic medication or a family history of schizophrenia spectrum or psychotic disorders, but um, having some non-psychotic uh, psychopathology would not be uh, an exclusion criteria for, for our healthy controls. Um, and the same exclusion criteria apply to this group as applied to the, um, to the UHR cohort. Okay, so this table um, is the first list of, of clinical assessments that will be conducted and the rationale for these measures was uh, wanting to capture a wide range of psychopathology, which we know is of course present um, in this clinical population, and also based on sort of some existing evidence for the predictive value of these um, different uh, different measures or, or um, symptom domains, um, if you like, but also balancing these um, considerations with uh, not wanting to be too burdensome to, to participants. So we needed to keep the assessment battery as, as lean as, as, as possible. And importantly, you know, we're capturing in a fairly fine grained way, all the treatment and health service utilization that participants will um, receive over the follow-up period um, and factoring that into our predictive modeling, adjusting for the treatment received both psychosocial and pharmacological, um, which I think has probably been lacking in some predictive modeling studies to date um, in this field. Um, so you can see from that uh, table of the clinical measures that quite a number of the measures um, are, are, are repeated over time. So they're repeat assessments, particularly the BPRS actually, um, which will be repeated monthly. Um, and we think that repeat assessments are important to accurately capture outcome, obviously, you know, um, but obviously incorporate, but also incorporating into uh, dynamic predictive modeling approaches. 
Um, so they're not only outcome variables, but also sort of independent or predictive variables. And, you know, an, an analogy that I often use to sort of illustrate this idea is the, the Google Maps uh, type idea that obviously, you know, spits out a certain um, prediction of, of travel time when you first set out on a journey, but then is updated in a dynamic fashion over time based on um, events that happen along the way um, and um, gives a new estimate of your time of arrival and so on. So this is a, a prediction that updates itself in a dynamic fashion. In the same way, uh, a number of approaches you know, um, exist in, in um, uh, mental health research and, and um, health research more broadly um, to dynamically predict outcome over time. And one of these is, is joint modeling, which basically uh, combines a linear, linear mixed effects model with a Cox regression framework. Um, and what you do in developing joint models is to identify the significant baseline predictive variables, and then the deter determine the significance of each time dependent predictor or each variable that changes over time after adjusting for the significant baseline predictors. Because you only want to use this, this dynamic approach if it improves on baseline prediction. If baseline prediction already does the trick, you know, and yields very high uh, predictive values, then there's limited utility in actually, you know, um, uh, adding in, you know, time dependent predictors to that model. So you, don't, you want to adjust for the predictive value of the baseline variables. And together, the most significant time dependent predictors are combined with the baseline predictors to produce um, a joint model. Now, this has been this approach has been applied in a number of areas um, in general medicine, so sort of kidney disease, ovarian cancer, and so on. Some examples of papers are up on the slide here. It has also been used um, in psychiatry, um, for example, predicting a time to relapse um, in depression and, and psychosis, and also medication discontinuation. Um, but there have been limited studies really applying it to date in the um, psychosis risk area. Uh, so that's something that we certainly want to do with the data that we're collecting in, in AMP schizophrenia. Uh, and we have already applied this approach to some data we've, um, we've collected. Um, in, this is an, an example from the NeuroPro trial, which was our omega-3 treatment study in the UHR population, a multi-site international trial. And these um, rock curves compare um, a joint model, um, the gray line here versus a baseline prediction model, uh, the orange line. And we found that uh, much stronger sensitivity statistics, so true positive cases, you know, could be identified using this joint model, this dynamic prediction model compared to the baseline model. And it was chiefly sort of changes in um, BPRS scores. Um, which uh, improved the performance of this joint model compared to the baseline model. And that was one of the rationales for including these repeat BPRS assessments in, in AMP schizophrenia. Uh, just to illustrate um, this uh, approach a little bit further, this, um, these are some cases from that analysis of the, of the NeuroPro data using joint modeling. Um, who These are transitioned cases, so cases who developed psychosis, um, who are identified using the joint model, predicted using the joint model, but missed using the uh, baseline prediction model from that study. Um, and the, you know, some characteristics you can see in these cases is an early increase in symptomatology post baseline. Um, the blue star represents the point um, where transition was predicted um, using the joint model. So in all cases, it was post baseline. So the, uh, the prediction was missed using the baseline model, as I said, um, but also well before the point of transition. You can see in a, you know, a number of months before the point of transition. So uh, the idea being that that provides enough time, ideally to implement you know, preventive um, intervention strategies to hopefully avert that, um, that transition from occurring. Okay. So moving on to the digital momentary assessments to being, being conducted in AMP schizophrenia. Um, so this, uh, a number of different digital uh, phenotyping measures will be captured in the project. There'll be ecological momentary assessments or EMA captured using the MindLamp app, uh, looking at daily changes in mental state and context and examples of items listed in, in the table here. It looks a lot better on, on the app. This is just a, a sort of an early version of the, um, of the items. Um, passive sensing will be conducted using smartphone sensors, GPS, and accelerometer. 
The actigraphy will be collected use, using um, activity watches. Um, so capturing data such as uh, sleep-wake cycles, levels of activity, sedentary behavior, and so on. So this will be um, daily uh, data captured over a 12-month period. Um, Okay, now there's a whole range of um, points that have been made to support um, this type of data collection. The rationale, you know, is listed up here on the table, but just to focus on one uh, aspect of the rationale, the temporally granular aspect of the data that we can connect, collect through this digital phenotyping. So this is an example of some EMA data um, collected in Melbourne by Annie Ching, uh, one of our um, students. Um, and let me just play this. So on the left, you can see uh, the relationship to various symptoms over time. Uh, red edges indicate negative relationships and green positive relationships. And the thicker the connection line, the stronger the relationships. And these loops that you can see up here auto, uh, auto correlations are how strongly a symptom correlates with itself over time. And on the right panel, the black line represents the sort of absolute correlation or what's called the sort of the network density, how strongly the various symptoms are related to each other in, 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 in a network across time. And what you can see is a sharp increase um, in symptomatology and this sort of network density, the relationship between the symptoms shortly before the point of, of conversion. In this case, in this case I'm showing here, this was actually a conversion to severe depression rather than to psychosis. Um, but it was around um, 10 to 12 days prior to this uh, point of conversion to, uh, to severe depression. So the thinking is perhaps a similar approach can be used in AMP schizophrenia to identify these, these early warning signs, you know, uh, to catch uh, imminent tipping points into uh, a more severe stage of mental disorder, in this case, transition to full threshold psychosis using this collection of digital data. Um, and, you know, this whole approach of, of tipping points and so on really emerges from complex systems theory that um, you know, Martin Sheffer and colleagues have written about extensively. It's been applied to various areas, you know, that can be described as complex systems, such as financial markets, um, climate change, and so on. Um, and it tries to approximate how stable a certain complex system might be and how close it might be to a tipping point into an alternative state. Um, and of course, in the area of psychiatry, we're talking about, I guess, a um, state of mental health into a state of more severe mental disorder. And this um, whole approach is based on um, uh, network theory and different complex systems might have a different form of tipping point or transition to an alternative state based on their underlying network architecture. And I encourage you to have a look at um, Sheffer's work to um, get into that idea in, in more detail. But uh, various um, statistical indices have been identified to look at how close a system, a complex system might be to a tipping point into an alternative state. So in this case, transition to psychotic disorder, the fluctuations in the system, um, a slowing down and a return to a, an equilibrium state, greater variance in memory and autocorrelation over time. All of these sort of statistical indices have been used as early warning signs of mental state change. And it's been validated in areas such as depression and bipolar disorder. And really the idea in AMP schizophrenia is to see whether this approach has utility in um, psychosis prediction as well, the outcomes of interest in AMP schizophrenia. Um, okay, so this whole dynamic, you know, uh, prediction approach, um, obviously, the, there are implications for treatment here, we can come up with dynamic or updating risk calculators over time, possible alert systems when a person might be showing some of these early warning signs, it can assist with um, uh, adaptive trial design, so uh, treatment studies that might modify or intensify treatment over time in, in response to increasing risk, and also enrich samples post baseline for enrollment in clinical trials. So final section, so I'll speak about the um, speech and video collection we'll be doing in AMP schizophrenia. So it'll be, um, this type of data will be collected through um, open-ended interviews, the Sykes interview, uh, and also audio diaries um, collected daily uh, via people's phones. And we'll be able to look at language content and structure, speech acoustics, 
and um, facial expressions using different software. Um, and obviously, you know, there's been uh, findings to date indicating that language uh, disturbance, thought disorder um, can predict um, clinical outcomes of interest, particularly transition. All of these have been mainly based on interview-based ratings. And what's been developed in recent years are automated or machine learning approaches, you know, computational type approaches to look at uh, variables such as semantic coherence and syntactic complexity, Cheryl Corker and Guillermo Cecchi have done a lot of work in this area. And classification models have been developed for being able to predict outcome, which have held up pretty well so far, but in reasonably small samples, but they have held up, you know, um, across different languages and across different uh, samples. So external validation has been done, but we'll be able to look at this in a much larger sample in AMP schizophrenia. There have been some recent studies integrating language disturbance with other levels of analysis, so uh, neurophysiological measures, um, and also some neuroimaging findings have appeared as well. Um, and I think that's the real opportunity that is presented with AMP schizophrenia is we'll be collecting all these different data modalities in a lot of detail. Um, and the challenge will be to, I guess, coherently uh, bring all these levels of analysis together in a way which can be used um, to provide insight into mechanisms driving disorder, into clinical decision-making tools. And um, I, I guess the ultimate goal is to improve, you know, treatments, so novel treatment development as well. Um, so I've just very quickly, because I'm running out of time, um, but one um, example of how this multimodal type approach might be useful with clinical decision making tools is the sort of probabilistic approach to combining multimodal data um, that uh, Scott Clark, one of our colleagues involved in, in Prescient, has, has championed this approach. I encourage you to have a look at this 2015 publication that describes it in detail. But basically, it yields an estimate of the additional predictive value of adding in further assessments um, or assessment types into the predictive modeling, uh, and it corrects or adjusts for the base rate uh, of a particular outcome of interest in, a, in the sample that we're looking at. So it's very much informed by Bayesian uh, statistical principles. Um, and, you know, in that paper, there's some simulation data which reports that at least three consistently positive or negative sequential tests were required in um, UHR samples or clinical help seeking samples uh, to pass whether individuals belong to sort of higher risk or low risk groups, whereas in general population samples with a lower base rate risk, uh, four multimodal assessments were required to really separate uh, individuals out into these high risk, intermediate and low risk groups. Okay, so I'll finish there. Um, now, obviously, in, in uh, large consortium studies like this, there are so, um, so many people involved. So I'd like to acknowledge all the investigators in Melbourne and across the Australian sites and internationally, of course, and the, all the project managers and research assistants working on this study. Um, and also we're working very closely, of course, with PRONET, the other research network, with the DPAC, um, and with the public and private uh, AMP schizophrenia partners. So thank you very much for your attention. Um, and I will stop screening, um, share the, share, sharing the screen. Okay, so um, our next uh, presenter and our final uh, presenter is Professor uh, Martha Shenton. So Martha Shenton, uh, PhD, is Professor of uh, Psychiatry and Radiology at Harvard Medical School and Director of uh, the Psychiatry Neuroimaging Laboratory at Brigham and Women's Hospital. Um, and if I'm, if I'm not wrong, I think it might be Martha's uh, birthday today. So happy, happy birthday, Martha, uh, Martha, Marty, if that is indeed the case. Um, okay, so we'll, we'll start um, Dr. Shenton's presentation now. And um, if you have any questions for, um, for uh, Dr. Shenton or any of the other presenters, please just um, pop them on the website in the question area and we can get back to them at the end. So over to you, Marty. I want to thank Barnaby for that introduction. Uh, this is the last presentation of the Schizophrenia Consortium 
and I'm pleased to present the Data Processing Analysis and Coordination Center, DPAC, uh, that will work, work hand in hand with the two research networks, the NIMH, FNIH, and private uh, public partners to provide, as the name suggests, the Data Processing Analysis and Co Coordination Center efforts for the AMP skits Consortium. And I'm PI of the DPAC along with uh, Renee Kahn. Uh, just by way of overview, I'll give a little bit of the aims right here, and then I'll talk a little about the organizational structure, uh, the sites and key personnel, and then I'll give a brief review of the cores. Uh, we have four cores and their functions because that's really the heart of the work that we're doing um, to uh, coordinate the data capture efforts, um, to build flexible infrastructure, to accommodate multiple data types, and we're going to be developing and refining pipelines that provide rapid processing. And this will be in close to real time as possible, and also including quality assurance and control. And uh, we'll also be providing the data coordination management and monitoring of the data. Uh, another task that we're going to be involved in is to develop powerful and robust uh, st stratification tools to identify and validate biomarkers and predict individual outcome trajectories. And another function is to archive data and make it publicly available in the National uh, Institute of Mental Health Data Archive. We also will be doing a dissemination of information, including the tools that are de developed uh, to the general public. And we're gonna be providing an outreach to the community uh, via a website um, as the study is going. In fact, that's going to be launched very soon. Uh, in terms of the organizational structure, as I said, Renee Kahn and I are the co-directors and we have five associate directors, four of whom are computer scientists. And I mentioned that to emphasize the technical expertise that the DPAC has and brings to bear um, for this large consortium project. And Cheryl Corcoran, who is at Mount Sinai and is a psychiatrist, who also is involved in some of the technical aspects that involve language acquisition, a language analysis and the acquisition of the data. We have a clinical trialist. Core one is about the coordination and monitoring. Uh, and we have two co-leads and that's Cheryl Cochran and um, Merrick Kabicki. Core two is the data management and it includes um, uh, Sylvan Buicks and Justin Baker, as well as Russ Russell Poldrack. Core three is the data analysis and visualization. Um, and here IBM uh, is working uh, in, with uh, Guillermo Chechi's team, along with Ofer Pasternak and Danny Mathalon. And core four is the dissemination of resources core. Um, and all of this will be coordinated with the National um, uh, data archive, where there's a focus on the harmonization of data dictionaries, data upload and deployment of data analytic tools uh, within the NDA. And just in terms of the sites, the sites for the DPAC involve Brigham and Women's Hospital, Mount Sinai, IBM Research, McLean Hospital, Mass General Hospital, Northern California Institute for Research and Education, and Stanford. Uh, university. And here's just some pictures of the people involved in the four cores. And we have a senior program manager along with our clinical trialist and our co-directors. For core one, the coordination and monitoring um, core, the tasks that are primarily involved with the two research networks are to assist in selecting standardized and standardizing and harmonizing all variables, uh, creating identical electronic data capture forms for both networks, and setting standard operating procedures for all biomarker domains. And then we also schedule and provide minutes for all the meetings and work groups. Another function of Core 1, um, and that involves the um, Inga Winter, who's our clinical trialist, is to monitor and do quality assurance tasks, in, such as uh, tracking recruitment and retention rates, establishing monitoring plans for each of the networks, reviewing source documentation, and confirming network training for all biomarker domains. And this is just an example of Prescient um, in Melbourne and Pronet 
where the hub is at Yale. They have perhaps different instruments when they started. For example, the CARMS uh, at Prescient and the SIPs at um, Pronet. And um, they had to come up with a, um, a one scale that sort of represents both. And this is gonna be a new um, scale called the um, Sykes. Uh, but the bottom line here is that all the instruments have to be the same at all 42 sites. And this is done in conjunction um, with the DPAC in collaboration with the Prescient and Pronet research networks where we harmonize the instruments. And then we have basically a form created into a data capture system. And this um, gets reviewed and when the final edits are done, um, which is an iteration going back and forth to the networks from the DPAC, the forms are finalized and ready uh, for data capture. We're also very much involved in the sample size working subgroups um, in terms of standard operating procedures workflow. And here we're talking about the different data types. For example, um, the DPAC itself was labeled as Team A, but Team B and I are involved with um, ascertainment and clinical outcomes. Uh, team C, um, EEG, uh, Team D, neuroimaging, Team E, cognitive measures, Team F, genetics and fluid biomarkers, Team G, digital biomarkers, um, EMA, and Team H was the speech sampling. And um, basically, um, our function was to work with the teams to make sure that all of the measures are standardized, that we have standard operating procedures, and we worked in conjunction with NIMH to review these and give feedback. Right, in terms of data monitoring uh, activities, the DPAC has two different systems set up to accommodate to the different needs of the network. Um, and this is just an example of the sites and the ProNet coordinating team and then the DPAC. Um, and uh, for the prescient, uh, it's site to the prescient coordinating team with DPAC members um, involved. And here it's again, um, just to repeat briefly, it's tracking recruitment and retention rates, establishing monitoring plans. And I'll say a little bit more about this uh, when we talk about the DP dashboard, which is um, something that's being created by Core2 that um, members there will work very closely to make a tool available for doing these functions. And getting now to core two, which is the data management. Some of the things that are important here are to talk about data principles, data capture systems, data dictionaries, validation and QC, data processing and the visualization of um, the data and data flow and upload to the NDA plus data monitoring, which again is in conjunction with core one. Now, just in terms of data management processing, uh, the guiding principle is FAIR. And what is FAIR? FAIR is findable data, accessible data, interoperable data, and reusable data. And the little um, red footnote really highlights down here that NIH Office of Data Science Strategy works with 27 NIH institutes to promote a modernized data resource ecosystem where all of biomedical research data across all the institutes it should adhere to fair principles. And this is something that's going to be a major um, part of how we collect data across all the NIH institutes. And for our purposes here, the DPAC uh, will have continuous data flow from acquisition to NDA. QAQ procedures will um, occur at every step of the data flow. Uh, everything will be reproducible in terms of workflows and we'll do visual monitoring through an online dashboard. Now the, dash, uh, the data acquisition, data capture, data aggregation, QC pro processing, monitoring and sharing is presented here as a kind of a data flow and the goal is to have it fast track. And if you look here, the acquisition, these are the data types, they're very different. And we need to be able to accommodate all the different types from survey, interview, to video, to um, speech samples, to EEG, to MRI, um, to actigraphy um, on smartwatches and DNA and fluid biomarkers. The data needs to be captured in a uniform fashion. And so, so for example, um, REDCap will be used to capture 
this kind of interview data, XNet um, for imaging data and so forth. And when there isn't <laughs> an easy way um, to collect and capture the data, we will use um, Dropbox folders. Uh, it'll also be aggregated, and this we're using something called Lochness um, that's been um, slowly evolving and changing. It's work that Justin Baker has been doing with Randy Buckner. And then we'll be doing QC and processing, and we'll be using high performance computers, but also um, the Amazon um, cloud, where we'll be able to um, use a cloud to actually work on data and have access for other people to join us uh, within the consortium. And then there'll be data sharing and analysis, and eventually the, the data goes out um, to the general public. And then we have this monitoring deep, deep P dashboard to look at the data. And in terms of data flow, and I'm just gonna go over this very quickly, the data comes from the networks, here's ProNet and Prescient, and there's a hub, the ProNet hub, where data capture and aggregation takes place. And the same thing for Prescient, it comes into the NDA, where the predict DPAC, where we'll have um, a cloud, a role there. And um, basically, um, some of the data will get done more quickly to go to the AMP skits collaborative space where AMP partners will be involved. The data dashboard is over here. Um, and we'll also be downloading some of the data um, to our pipelines um, that exist at the Brigham in order to analyze further. And then the final um, Q AQC is done at the NDA as it's done for all projects that come into the NDA and then out to the research community. In terms of visual monitoring, the dashboard is designed to manage and visualize multiple data streams coming in continuously over an extended period of time in individuals. And so we can um, set things up to visualize at the study level, which is up here at the site level. So we can monitor um, at any one site um, if people are, are for some reason missing getting the MRI data versus another site is having more trouble meeting milestones for EEG. We can also look at the instrument level and the individual level. And <clears throat> this is um, going to be available to the PIs of the network and they will decide who within the consortium can also have data. And NIMH will also be able to have this tool as will the partners and um, uh, co-leads and, and associate directors of the DPAC. Um, and this is an example of a report that we're building in reports in order to visualize the different data. So if we picked 85% for a milestone for meeting what's um, um, basically uh, expected for say enrollment versus actual, we'll be able to see how far um, we've met our um, goals. We can also look at different sites and these are just put down as examples. Um, and we can also visualize it. For example, the actual enrollment is here 15.6% uh, um, black, but the, act, the expected enrollment is 25%. So you can look at that and say, okay, we're not meeting our milestones here. We need to make sure that we start recruiting more blacks or more males or more females, um, but it gives the flexibility and we're um, setting things up so that we can adapt it to what people at the individual's um, um, sites or research networks want to be able to visualize. And core three, the data analysis and visualization. Um, here, what the main goal is to identify is the identification of predictive um, clinical high risk biomarkers. And here we want to be able to identify subtypes based on outcome trajectories. We're also going to be generating individualized risk calculators. And there will also be data exploration and visualization with core two, which um, I've already uh, presented. Core three, um, in terms of the identification of predictive clinical high-risk biomarkers, here we want to leverage the multiple modalities and time points to generate multivariate prediction models that are robust and that they avoid overfitting and have advanced dimensionality reduction approaches. They're also flexible and they, where we can build models for various outcomes. Um, they'll also um, support multiple domains and time points and account for data paucity and asynchronicity. And we want them to be clinically 
informed. So we're going to integrate um, AI with human expertise. Uh, we want to incorporate prior beliefs and hypotheses and findings in the field of specific measures and derived variables of interest implied in previous studies and data distributions. Um, and we want to look at that in conjunction with um, some of the AI tools that we're going to be using um, that have been developed at IBM. And we want interpretable, interpretable uh, results, excuse me. Um, another function is to identify subtypes. Uh, as we all know, um, those of us who do clinical high-risk research, these are really very heterogeneous groupings. And, you know, it's not any big surprise that we um, don't find um, a lot of information from some of the, from clinical trials, and that can be very disappointing. But it, if you have a heterogeneous group of individuals, um, you're much less likely to find signal. There may be a small group of people, as shown here, um, that are uh, have a different probability than people here, and then the rest right now, you know, let's say are not subtyped appropriately. Um, but if you can look at people that um, are more homogeneous, the hope is that you're going to be able to subtype, which will lead to different clinical outcomes, um, and that biomarkers and outcomes can be um, looked at more carefully, and that the subtypes with larger prediction confidence um, will be able to have, plus there'll be a better understanding of the pathophysiology to facilitate the enrichment strategies in clinical trials. We also want to make sure we exploit exploit the multimodality of this <coughs> large number of measures and a large number of um, subjects. And we're going to use tools such as latent class growth, multivariate recursive and autoregressive modeling, dynamic um, time warping, and explainable AI, which is something um, that the IBM research team has been working on. Um, which they really want to push the field in terms of computational methods that are being applied here. The bottom line here is that we want to have effective prediction models and subtyping that would facilitate and be useful selection tools for clinical trials. We also want to generate individualized risk calculators. We want to evaluate um, the combination of risk, risk and protective factors that influence probability of clinical outcome. We want to look at relevant variables for an individual so we can estimate the probability of an outcome. And for the risk calculators, um, based on clinical, uh, clinically accessible measures, um, we want them to become useful clinical tools in community-based settings. So for example, we might have a proxy for something like um, an MRI machine, which is not right in the community for everyone to use. Um, but th the proxy is something else that um, is very highly correlated um, and very easy to measure and assess um, in a community-based setting. So our plan is to use multiple risk calculators for different outcomes and for different input types. Um, and they're gonna be dynamically evolving with the data collection and then we'll use advanced fusion of existing calculators. Uh, the tools will be multi-layer um, uh, uh, perceptron, random forest, um, Cox um, uh, regression, and other such measures. And then finally, I'm going to give a little bit of information about the um, core four dissemination of resources. Here, it's important um, for core four to focus on coordinating an internet presence, a website, which um, is almost ready to launch at this point now. Um, we want to be able to set up internal communication tools because there's a large number of investigators on this project. And we want to organize goal-directed hackathons, which is something that's been used in the computer science world, but not so much in other areas. And so we want to bring that um, to, to uh, this consortium where um, people will have dedicated time to approach specific um, uh, problems. And we want to organize workshop tutorials and challenges that will also involve people outside the consortium in the latter part of um, this whole project. Um, here's uh, the website. This is Accelerated Medicine Partnership, which is a trade uh, name now. And um, we have, this is our homepage right here. Uh, and uh, we have tabs across the top home about participating in the study for scientists. And um, 
Uh, we also have study sites. And here's another example of, on about the study with zip codes based search for the 42 sites. So you could click on any of these to see um, information about the, this um, PI of the site information, um, location. You can enter a zip code to see how close you are to any one of these sites. Um, it's just information um, that I think will be useful um, for people um, visiting that want to know more about clinical high risk for schizophrenia. And um, let's see. And then for internal communication, right now there have been about 240 investigators on um, AMP skits participants um, that use something called Basecamp. And this is a centralized document repository where meeting minutes and recordings and standard operating procedures and IRB protocols and links to Google Drive and links to Dropbox can be located. And uh, one of the functions of DPAC is to make sure this is organized and, um, and that people have access to projects that they're um, uh, a part of. And the directed, goal-directed hackathons were inspired by um, NAMIC open source hackathons and have been active since 2005. And NAMIC is the National Alliance for Medical Image and Computing. Um, and this, uh, the PI was Ron Kikinis, um, actually at the Brigham. And it's a hands-on problem solving um, approach where there are small dedicated groups. So one example might be coding harmonized instruments such as the Sykes, um, where people sit down who are very interested and passionate about trying to solve um, any problems that come up and trying to make um, the tool better for the research community. Initially in years two and three, um, we'll be talking about um, sort of things that are within AMPSKIT's community. And um, there'll be um, hackathons, so there'll be 12 hours in duration spread out over a week. And there'll be a limited number of projects, say one to three. In years four to five, uh, we'll broaden the scope to include more projects and duration to a week and invite external collaborators. And um, also there'll be workshops and tutorials in year four and five. Um, for example, tutorials and workshops on the tools for research in psychiatry and psychopathology um, could be presented at meetings such as this one, um, meetings such as the Schizophrenia International Research Society, the Society of Biological Psychiatry, and also um, algorithm challenges for AMP skits data for researchers that are more um, computationally oriented at other annual meetings such as MICI, Medical Image Computation and Computer-Aided Interventions, and Human Brain Mapping. And I just want to end with, um, I think that this is going to be one of the um, largest, uh, actually the largest um, repository of data on clinical high-risk subjects. And our goal is really to um, uh, have the best data possible um, acquired using um, uh, harmonization of all measures, standard operating procedures that are the same across 42 sites, and to be able to <coughs> assist in stratifying um, individuals into subgroups that are going to be meaningful for both clinical trials and ultimately um, for understanding the pathophysiology um, of this disorder in terms of who is more likely to become ill versus perhaps protective factors. And so I think this is really exciting and I am really pleased to be a part of this. And I think that ultimately this will be an important resource source for the research community. Uh, thank you very much. Well, thank you very much, uh, Marty, for outlining the DPAC and the, the function it will serve in AMP schizophrenia more broadly. And thank you to all, all the presenters for spending the time um, on their pre-recorded presentations and have been able to join us now for, um, for a live discussion. Um, I'm just checking the website to see whether there are any questions that have uh, come through on the platform. I can't see any at this stage, but let me just do a, a double check. Um, 
Okay, I can't see any at this point, but please somebody let me know if I'm missing any, but I'm just doing a, a scan. Okay, we'll just send in the audience, just send through any questions if you have any live. We have all presenters here, so we have some time to address any any comments or, or, or questions that people might have about these presentations or um, and schizophrenia more broadly. Um, okay, well, maybe, maybe I could just uh, pose something um, in the meantime. Um, so I'm just thinking about, I mean, IEPA, I mean, tends to have quite, quite an emphasis really on, on clinical practice, you know, clinical impl implications and some applications of all these different uh, research projects. So given that, I guess, you know, Scott or, or, or Sarah, could you perhaps say a bit more about um, the possible clinical applications of some of the outcomes of AMP schizophrenia. I know we've, we've, you know, we touched on those in, in the presentations, but perhaps we could um, say a little bit more about that. I mean, how this body of work might ultimately be uh, useful for clinicians on the ground, you know, doing day-to-day -day clinical work with this uh, clinical population of CHR uh, young people. Stop, feel free to go ahead. Yeah, I'll, I'll start to Sarah and then, um turn it over to you. So, um, you know, I, I've been, it's, a, it's embarrassing, but I've been working in this field for 25 years now. <laughs> and when I first started, um, I thought we would, um, you know, we would just go ahead and develop some new, some medications we could use for CHR. <laughs> and um, um, we've been, um, getting ready to do that uh, more or less ever since. We have had a number of, uh, a number of um, efforts, that's for sure. And uh, Barnaby mentioned a couple of the clinical trials and um, um, Marty mentioned them also. Um, but we haven't had anything that's actually led to um, a registration in any country. So um, this, is, is kind of a problem because um, uh, registration and approval for marketing in a, in, in a country leads to access and, um, and, and potentially widespread access. And so um, I think this is an important uh, step for the CHR uh, uh, field. And um, um, one, one, difficulty has been that we've been really laser focused on preventing conversion to psychosis and preventing schizophrenia. And I, I do think that's a very important aim, but um, there are a number of other outcomes of the CHR um, that could be targeted. And we'll, let's just pick uh, poor functioning uh, as one, for example. Um, if we could um, uh, predict using our biomarker and clinical battery, um, a, a group of patients that would uh, likely show stable, poor functioning in the absence of an intervention um, over time, then that would be the ideal group to enroll in a clinical trial of a medication that could improve function, that is the hopes to improve functioning because um, that would provide um, the best chance of showing a, dr a drug versus placebo difference, which would lead to registration approval. And um, having accomplished that, um, I think that would open the floodgates. If we did have a medication that was approved to improve functioning in CHR, why we would have a, a huge influx of new money into the field uh, it would allow us to do longer term studies to uh, investigate a, a conversion um, effect and a prevention of schizophrenia effect and um, would um, help, would uh, inspire other um, um, uh, efforts to develop medications for other outcomes as well. So th that's, um, I don't think we've quite got to that tipping point to use the uh, uh, phrase that uh, Barnaby used in his excellent presentation, but I'm hoping that um, AMP schizophrenia can get us to and over that tipping point. All right, thank you. Thank you, Scott. Is there anything anybody wanted to add to that, uh, Sarah or Marty? 
I, I would add just one thing, I think, with my NIMH RDOC hat on, right? So the Research Domain Criteria Initiative that was launched about 10 years ago by NIMH has an emphasis on exploring novel ways for classifying mental disorders and um, so, sort of avoiding assumptions about diagnostic heterogeneity and um, avoiding assumptions about diagnostic validity. Um, knowing that diagnostic criteria or diagnostic categories as they're currently defined are very heterogeneous. So I think our, I think that AMP schizophrenia is consistent with our doc because it's trying to integrate different um, assessment modalities um, to, to dissect diverse trajectories in, in the, among individuals who are at elevated risk. Um, so hopefully that will get us further down the road in terms of our doc's progress um, toward having more clinical applicability. Um, so that's it for me. Great, thank you, Sarah. Yeah. I'd like to add to mm. what both Scott and Sarah are saying. And um, that is, I mean, I think uh, what the AMPS gets um, offers us is a real opportunity. It's the largest study of its kind and it's going to allow us um, to actually be able to subtype in a way where we don't have to worry so much about the samples so small, and it's really multimodal. So there's going to be very many variables. And of course, the more variables you have, the more of a problem it is if the data set is small. And the fact that harmonization is being done um, to the best of our abilities at this point in time, um, I think that's really one, sort of one of the really high points of this, that it's going to be collecting data that's the same. We don't have to worry about things like doing meta-analysis and trying to figure out whether you're dealing with apples and oranges that you're trying to put together and they really shouldn't be merged together. We're trying very hard to make sure that the protocols are really the same across sites. And I think that makes this really unique and really promising. Um, and the data is also going to be available to the research community. Um, and, um, and it's going to be raw as much as possible so that, um, you know, the raw data will be there um, to look at for years to come. And um, the future, we don't know um, what's going to be needed. So I think this is one of the other advantages. A lot of things aren't going to be changed in the data. It's going to be as close to raw as possible for the community. And I think that's a real plus. Absolutely. No, thanks, Marty. And this data set will be available to researchers, as, as uh, Marty said earlier, uh, through the NDA system, the NIMH NDA. Researchers will be able to make applications to access this data set for their own uh, research purposes to address a range of research questions. So this is very much an open science approach. Um, and it's set up that, that way to advance the field as, as quickly as possible. Um, so I can see a few questions have been um, posed on the website here. So let me just read them out and perhaps um, somebody might want to address address these. So the first one is, it's not it's from Richard Wales, not to anybody in particular, but just generally. Uh, why not just focus on APS? So attenuated uh, psychotic symptoms or attenuated psychosis syndrome at the outset, rather than a wider vague heterogeneous risk group with grossly different transition rates. So Rich is asking, why don't, why don't we just narrow down on the APS, you know, subgroup within the um, CHR criteria rather than have these broader, you know, groups that focus on, you know, genetic risk and deterioration, the, the sort of family history based risk, attenuated psychotic symptoms, and also the blips or the BIPs based risk. These are the, you know, young people with very short lived psychotic symptoms without treatment. Um, so do, would anybody like to comment on that issue that Richard raises? Well, um, I guess this is getting us into the collegial discussion area of the presentation. And uh, we, we did have quite a few discussions on that uh, exact topic. And, um, um, I, um, and um, I could give my point of view on that. Uh, Barnaby, would you like to, uh, would you like to uh, give it a shot? Sure. Well, yeah, I can, I can kick off there. I mean, I mean, I think all 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 the groups that we know within the CHR um, um, 
definitions are, are at risk of poor outcomes. And we know that. I mean, we know there is variability for sure. I mean, the data indicates, you know, substantial heterogeneity there in terms of outcomes with the with the blips or the BIPs group seeming to be at highest risk, at least for conversion to psychosis. Um, but, you know, there's still, a, it's a generally unwell group that I think we are in need of um, improving our predictive, you know, um, power, you know, for. So I think there's there's clinical need there. And I think that's one justification for keeping keeping the um, the definition reasonably broad. I mean, there's the other advantage of it um, being consistent with previous work. So being able to bring the pre-existing, you know, the existing findings in the field to bear on the on the current program of work in terms of um, study design, measure selection. Um, I mean, for example, the choice of, of uh, the two month repeat biomarker point is based on analysis of data with the with the general with the broad CHR group, not not an APS group in particular. So, you know, using um, the, the pre existing data, and we need to make full use of all that data, you know, given the sort of limited sample sizes and so on. So we needed to sort of maximize, yeah, you know, inclusion of, of all of that data based on the full, you know, um, the full CHR definition to inform, you know, current work. So I think there's that consistency argument as well. Um, I guess there's also, I mean, getting back to the first discussion point about clinical utility. I mean, at the moment, at least, most of the clinical services around the world, you know, uh, early psychosis clinics, seeing CHR uh, patients, you know, are structured around that broader definition of CHR rather than being limited to that APS group. Um, now that might change in the future, but, you know, at, at the moment, that's the definition. So I, I guess we want our research findings to have um, as much implications for this, for the clinical group, the, you know, the, this group of young people coming into our clinics, which is broadly defined at this point. So I think from that clinical application point of view, there's there's an argument for keeping the you know the broader CHR definition as well. Um, yeah, those are, those are some points. But Scott, perhaps you want to um, extend. Yeah, I, I would, would just add that um, you know our our goal isn't really to decrease heterogeneity. <laughs> our goal is to identify homogenous subgroups. And so we, we more homogenous subgroups. And so we, we wanted to start with the, with the kind of sample that Barnaby uh, suggested that w- would be relevant to past research, current clinical practice, rather than limit it ahead of time. And, and for example, the, the, convert, the uh, functioning outcome that I j- just mentioned, um, the, the, there are patients who are meeting the current uh, CHR, UHR criteria who don't have um, um, uh, prominent positive symptoms, but do have functional impairment, and they might well be ideal candidates for inclusion in a future study um, focused on improving function. So if we threw them out, now we wouldn't learn that. So. Yeah, so in a sense, it's a deliberate strategy, isn't it, to keep things broad, you know, to begin with, to, you know, um, increased chances of of looking of identifying these these homogenous subgroups within that um, very broad clinical group uh, at the outset. Okay, Th- thank you. There's a couple more up here. I can see Noam Karen, who's has been involved all the way with am schizophrenia, has posted a question here, so that's nice. Thank you, Noam. Uh, so Noam makes the point. Thank you for the great presentations. I'd like to ask two questions. Uh, what in your opinions, increases the probability of this consortium accelerating our goal of fulfilling unmet needs of those at CHR for psychosis? How is it different from previous attempts? And then um, the second um, second question is, can you speak about the role of private partners and nonprofits, including individuals with lived experience in this study? Um, so Sarah, perhaps, do, do, do you have some thoughts on... on um, what gnome raises there? And I'll just switch this telephone off. <laughs> <laughs> sure. Yeah, I think um, if I remember correctly, Scott highlighted some um, areas of innovation um, in AMP schizophrenia. I think the number one would be the size and scope, of course. Um, it, it will be the largest study of its kind. So that in and of itself is a, is a large um, innovation and will allow us to do some of the types of analyses um, that we've discussed already. 
um, getting at uh, identifying meaningful subgroups of participants. Um, and and to, to weigh in on the role of the AMP schizophrenia partners, um, especially uh, groups representing individuals with lived experience, um, these, this has been a, a very um, fruitful collaboration and very informative over the large time span of the development of the AMP schizophrenia program. Um, and it's been tremendously helpful to have that input from the different perspectives as we make decisions that will um, inform future work on clinical trials and, um, and get perspective from people with lived experience about the acceptability and tolerability of different research procedures and how best to outreach to the community to maximize enrollment and success of the project. Uh, so we appreciate everything that FNI, the Foundation for NIH has done to um, forge that, that collaboration among the partners and the funded investigators and the government agencies. I'd like to add that um, the website um, uh, efforts um, of uh, the DPAC is working closely with um, uh, members of the research network, NIH and FNIH. And there's going to be a large component of um, reaching out to um, those with lived experience and to get feedback so that the website is um, really very directed to um, people who um, can benefit from um, getting information um, about clinical high risk. And, um, so. Great. Thanks, buddy. Thanks, Sarah. Um, okay. There's a Another question up here from um, Sandra Bucci. So, hi everyone, thanks for a fantastic symposium. Uh, this is such an exciting program of work. Congratulations to you all. One thing I'd be interested to hear your thoughts on is how you are going to balance obtaining the granularity and quality of data that you've spoken to versus the acceptability of this approach to prediction e.g. passive monitoring for 12 months uh, from service users perspective. I'd be interested to hear about any qualitative work you might do about uh, acceptability of the approach and exploring the ethics of this from service users uh, perspectives. Also, what are your thoughts on whether service users will use something like the activity device for 12 months? It is very resource intensive and perhaps not as acceptable, comfortable as other wearables like a Fitbit, um, though appreciate data granularity is compromised. Well, perhaps I can um, just start by addressing the the uh, second point about the activity devices. I mean, I think that's a that, that's a good point, um, Sandra. I mean, we have we do have some existing data on that. At least at, at Origin, we use these activity devices for a twelve month period with uh, with some success. That was actually some of the data I presented in the. the um, uh, in the in the in the presentation that uh, was based on that activity device um, data capture, we were concerned about whether um, our participants would um, tolerate or accept, you know, using these devices for a twelve month period. Um, but the acceptance rate was actually reasonably uh, reasonably high, higher than we expected. Um, it was about 50% in the particular study, which was a broader, a broader at-risk group, not just CHR for psychosis. Um, and people stuck with it, you know, for the for the 12 month period. And that was actually one of the uh, rationales for including, you know, this intensive uh, EMA and passive sensing um, approach in AMP schizophrenia. The existing data that it was um, that it was feasible and and useful data to to collect. Um, it's also voluntary, um, which mm -hmm. makes a difference, I think. Um, yeah. Yeah, the exactly. overall, so that's... overall participation in the project is voluntary, of course, as all, all research is. Oh, oh, absolutely. But this is sort of, it, in addition, this is separate. It's a separate sign-on, pretty much. Right. So we, 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 uh, we were aware that that um we're enrolling patients and uh, they they um, have difficulties in their lives that are um, very important and we don't we don't want to study um, 
to be so difficult or so burdensome that um, most, you know, that, uh, that uh, an unrepresentative sample would be unwilling to participate. Um, so um, because of those considerations, some of these um, uh, digital um, markers for a year that you mentioned, um, we've made optional in the consent form. So this, so the whole um, and schizophrenia battery has a um, a core battery, and the the expectation is that you know people are signing up to do all assessment modalities. But as as Marty and Scott um, indicate, the digital biomarkers, which are more yeah time intensive, and as Sandra was saying, and you know more a longer term commitment, if you like, for this you know this twelve month period daily assessments is a is a, is a voluntary you know aspect of it. So people can opt out of. Um, of that component of the assessment battery if, if they like. But I think one of the issues that Sandra's also raising here is about doing some qualitative work, looking at the acceptability of the, of the approach and exploring ethics of this from the service user's perspectives. Um, we don't have that built in, you know, to, to the AMP schizophrenia study at the moment, but it's certainly something that could be done as a sort of a sub-study of AMP schizophrenia doing, you know, recruiting a, um, a subgroup who uh, take part in the study, you know, generally and, and doing some more detailed qualitative work with them about how they experienced the assessments, uh, how acceptable they were, you know, to, uh, to the participants um, and any suggestions they might have, you know, for, for changing the approach going forward. As I said, I mean, the rationale for it was based on existing data, but I think, you um, it's a good point, uh, Sandra, that perhaps some further work could be done with with this new de um, uh, new cohort examining, you know, these questions in a, in a bit more detail. So we could certainly take that on board. Okay, um, let me. I'll just refresh the screen again to see if any other questions have come up. I don't well, just think add to, to that, mm. Barnaby. That yep. uh, I just like to echo Sarah's earlier point that throughout the um, AMP schizophrenia protocol development. Um, we've been, um, you know, actively seeking uh, input from um, uh, partners with uh, lived experience. So, uh, so it, it is something that uh, we've been very uh, aware of. Absolutely. Okay. I don't think there are any other questions up on the website at this stage on the on the platform. Um, I do just, uh, I guess, a, a final point, perhaps, unless some further questions turn up, is around the the challenges of of you know integrating all these different data types, you know, different different you know data modalities, and I don't know, Marty, whether you want to speak to this or, or anybody else. And I mean, it's not something that has been achieved in the field before, at least to this extent. I mean, certainly there have been multimodal prediction models, but here we're collecting a whole range of data across, you know. Um, uh, you know, a number of um, different modalities um, and uh, in a large data set. And the challenge, of course, will be to, you know, how do we effectively integrate, you know, all of all of this data, you know, imaging with with digital data, with neurocog and so on. Um, and I'm just wondering, are we aware of any examples of how this has been done before? Is there any, you know, precedent for integrating, um, you know, modalities across across all these different types in a, in a useful way, you know, perhaps from other disorders I don't think there's anything in our field that's this large and we also have um, mm. uh, uh, IBM uh, is very much involved with a totally very different approach using um, uh, uh, machine learning um, techniques which is going to be added to what um, the expertise we already have using um, different prediction models. Um, but I think the advantage is it's sort of like standing on a new frontier where uh, we're, we're going to have more of everything in order to um, approach what we know, what the problems are, we know what our aims are. Now it's um, using the tools and, you know, many might just be dis discarded early um, and um, so I think this is the sort of the fun part um, as a scientist to discover um, what works and what doesn't. And I think we're going to have a lot of surprises as well as um, things that we expect. So um, I look forward to that myself. 
Absolutely. No, me too. I think a lot of people are now looking forward to getting stuck into this, this data set once it starts building up. So, yeah. Okay. Well, I think um, that's it on the questions and the, and the, and the comments front. Um, so I'm not sure if Sarah or Scott or Marty, if you wanted to, to add anything to what's been said already. Mm -hmm. No, nothing to add. Thank you, Barnaby. Yeah. Thank you, Barnaby. Oh, thank and you. Thank you, audience, so we can't see. <laughs> yes, that's right. We do. We assume there are people out there. We can't see you all, but there have been some some questions. So we know that there is life out there. Um, so, no, but well, clearly, I mean, this is going to be a tremendously, I mean, useful, you know, groundbreaking, really, you know, data set for the field. So um, we're going to um, start uh, our recruitment very soon. And hopefully at the next IPA, you know, we'll be able to update, you know, on the consortium's progress and including some some data analysis. So we'll, we'll um, get back to the IPA on, on, on progress as we go forward. Um, so I think, thank you all the presenters for, you know, for your time um, and for doing the pre-recorded presentations. That was great. Um, and I think this is the end of the um, conference proceedings for today. So thank you to the audience as well. Um, and I've got a note here that says to, uh, to watch the conference closing, please stay in this room. Uh, the closing will commence shortly uh, for people who want to stay on for that. And uh, for any sessions that you might have missed, and you want to go back to uh, recordings that will be available on demand uh, within 24 to 48 hours at the conclusion of the live event. So you can go back to the platform and, um, and watch those uh, if you want to. So thank you, everybody. I think with that, we'll, we'll conclude this symposium.